Fixing the American healthcare system has been one of the most difficult and divisive problems in modern U.S. history. The Affordable Care Act has helped more Americans than ever gain insurance, yet the remaining problems have led the Republican-controlled Congress to put repeal and replace at the top of their legislative agenda in 2017. Why has health insurance been such a tricky issue in the United States? Why did our insurance model develop differently than in other industrialized countries, and how can this help us understand the problems we face today? In this episode of The Road to Now, we speak with Dr. Melissa Thomason of Miami University to find out. I'm Ben Sawyer. I'm Bob Crawford. And this is The Road to Now. Well, Ben, uh, this is going to be Monday morning when people hear this. Right, our first episode of the Trump administration. That's right, and perhaps the day that Obamacare, the signature piece of legislation for the 44th president, Barack Obama, now regular citizen, uh, citizen Barry, if you will, um, will be repealed and possibly replaced. Yeah, and uh, maybe maybe it will, maybe it won't. Uh, Maybe that's not as easy to do as what people have said. And it's kind of interesting because, uh, uh, you know, Trump has set a really high bar for Congress by proclaiming that everyone will have health insurance and that it will be way better when, as we talked about today, history doesn't suggest that that's so easy to do. Well, there's one thing I know about Trump care. It's going to be huge. It's going to be huge. (laughs) We're going to love it bigly. (laughs) And it's going to be great. It's going to be just, it's going to be great. I can't wait. That you, I'm sold, Bob. I'm sold, Bob. Yeah. I don't need any details. I don't need any details whatsoever. <laughs> well, here we here we are, man. It's uh, so we thought. You know, we've been trying to cover things, put put uh, modern events in historical context. Our last couple of episodes, we've been really happy with, and you guys have given us great response. And so now here we are. The pressing issue on the agenda is healthcare and healthcare reform. And today's episode is dedicated to helping you understand this issue. We've got two parts for you. We're going to begin with a short segment by Road to Now contributors Matt Negrin and Alex Trowbridge, who have put together an incredibly concise rundown of the history of the Affordable Care Act that suggests that reforming health care in the United States is not such an easy thing to do. After that, we have a conversation about the history and economics of our health insurance model with Dr. Melissa Thomason. Dr. Thomason is the Julian Lang Professor of Economics at Miami University of Ohio and one of the foremost experts on the economic history of the American healthcare system. So without further ado, here's Matt and Alex. We can't afford the politics of delay and defeat when it comes to healthcare. Not this time, not now. Welcome to Path to the Present. I'm Alexander Trowbridge. I'm Matt Negrin. And we are just going to be talking about healthcare right now. <laughs> Obamacare, a.k.a. The Affordable, the Affordable Care, Care Act. Act. Or yeah, yeah, some yeah. people think it's two different things. <laughs> totally different things. <laughs> One of them sounds better than the other. <laughs> so we want to talk about this right now because we are at a period of time where we have a new administration coming in, <laughs> a new party that is vowing to repeal and replace, and they're acting like that replace aspect of that <laughs> oh, slogan they got that is going to be super <laughs> easy. Uh, so we wanted to travel back in time to 2009 when Obamacare first came into existence and some of the battles that took place and why Republicans might have a fight ahead of them. That when you look at how many hurdles Obama had to jump through and knock over just to get this thing passed, procedurally, uh, culturally, philosophically, how, how is it even possible that Republicans think it's going to be easy? It's going to be a nightmare. Especially when you have Republicans and then you have Trump. Yes. It's like a, an entirely <laughs> different party. Not the smoothest thing. Not the smoothest sort of formula. currently working together right now, but we'll see. Well, starting with what Trump most recently said about uh, health care, this sets the whole thing in context. Yes. So he uh, talked with the Washington Post over the weekend, one of his favorites, a phoner. <laughs> a <laughs> a classic. phone interview. <laughs> Trump classic. And he promised insurance for everybody. That's a direct quote. Much less expensive, much lower deductibles. And then he said this, quote, there was a philosophy in some circles that if you can't pay for it, you don't get it. That's not going to happen with us. By the way, you know what? 
insurance for everyone means universal. <laughs> That's right. like very, very, very right. close to universal. saying universal coverage. So you go back to April 2011, and he was saying something much different. He was asked by George Stephanopoulos back then whether he supported universal health care. And he was saying, you know, we're in a much different time. We used to think 12, 14 years ago, we used to think we had a wealthy nation. We could take care of people. The fact is we're in a much different time now. The world has changed a lot. So Stephanopoulos asks, uh, you no longer support universal health care? And then he says, I support health care for people. <laughs> <laughs> I support health care for people. I want people well taken care of, but I also want health care that we can afford as a country. Very controversial position. Health care for people. <laughs> health care for people. <laughs> it, 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 so back then, he's sounding like Republicans in the Ryan camp mm -hmm. sound now, which is... Uh, let's not emphasize universal coverage like Obama and the Democrats did. Let's emphasize lowering costs to something we can actually afford mm -hmm. as a country. Not a total surprise that he would want to sound like a conservative establishment Republican in 2011 when right. it looked like Ob Obama's approval ratings were very low. A lot of people thought Romney was going to beat him just because Obama was a beatable yeah. incumbent and Trump wanted to be positioned as like a reasonable guy. But and just for context, <laughs> the question that preceded that question was, uh, you still looking for Obama's birth certificate? And he was like, hell yeah, I'm still looking for Obama's birth certificate. Certificate. <laughs> hey, we got to the bottom of that, <laughs> thanks to Donald Trump. <laughs> later on, later on. <laughs> but, but right now, he's making it seem like this is going to be easy, like this is going to take place, and he's going to be able to hit yes. these promises, like insurance for everybody, and it's going to cost much less. It's going to be more simple. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. Sounds you're going to love it. You go back to 2009. Totally different story. Where you had President Obama coming in. He wanted... Obamacare signed that year. He wanted a health care package in his State in of the Union. 2009. State of the Union. He says, can't, can't wait. Yep. He said, by October. Mm -hmm. Then he was like, uh, by this year. <laughs> and then it ended up happening later in 2010 and, because that fight got dragged out. And one thing that must have been clear to Obama's team and Hillary's team during the primary was that universal health care was very popular. They mm -hmm. were both campaigning for it. In fact, mm -hmm. Hillary, they, their positions were almost identical. They were like very, like a little bit different, but they both wanted universal health care, and everyone responded to that with like an overwhelming yes. And then they, like Obama, won dramatically. It seemed like he had a mandate to go across the country and pitch this, and everyone was going to say, "Yeah, we want health care now." And Americans were like, "Just get in, we totally got you." <laughs> Psych. <laughs> well, he was up against a lot. So let's go back to 2009. We'll yeah. time travel. Let's go through some of the things that President Obama was up against as he was trying to put this health okay, package the, together. There were a lot of things. There are people in Congress. There are senators. There were uh, people in the House. There mm -hmm. were also the, the Tea Party. So what are we starting with? What's right, like right. the well, first okay, thing? We'll, we'll start with his Republican opposition. You okay. had Republicans like South Carolina Senator Jim DeMint, mm -hmm. then Senator Jim DeMint, saying stopping Obama's bid for health care would be akin to the president's Waterloo. And the, Jim DeMint was also the guy, uh, I mean, among with so many Republicans, calling it a government takeover, yes, right? a government takeover, and health care was going to be where they stopped this incredibly popular president mm -hmm. in his tracks. And then the thing that Mitch McConnell said almost, what, days after Obama was inaugurated? We're going to make him a one-term right. president. So you had that taking place. Then in his own party... You had plenty of dissension. You had moderate, uh, moderate Democrats, conservative Democrats, the mm -hmm. blue dog Democrats, mm -hmm. folks, folks like Bart Stupak, who were afraid that that somehow uh, increasing coverage to health care would cause uh, federally funded abortions. Because he's from a, a conservative district and mm -hmm. people who vote Demo people who voted for him still are, you know, they have, have to watch his butt. Right. And then people like Senator Ben Nelson, who was. I mean, Obama came into office with a 60-seat majority in the mm -hmm. Senate, which is a supermajority, which means you can override a filibuster. Well, it became a 60-seat majority when uh, Al Franken won right. his race, and then uh, Specter switched parties. And Specter, yeah, Spe Specter switched from Democrat to Republican to Democrat. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and all of a sudden, you've got this, like, seemingly... Uh, invincible shield against mm -hmm. a Republican filibuster on health care and, and Ben Nelson was this like conservative Democrat who was on the fence and so they had they were all the, the backroom talks and mm -hmm. uh, the, mm -hmm. the corn husker kickback which is what like one of the most hilarious phrases that came out of that was like oh yeah we'll give Ben Nelson this like this like whatever what did they give him for his home for his district or something like some oh, you know yeah, stupid some funding barrel spending right. as so John it's like, McCain would call it so that you can be the vote that guarantees health care for every single American right right, right. <laughs> and you had the RNC running ads against him mm -hmm. I mean July of 2009 
showing little kids looking very upset at the camera. And the, the narrator comes on, he says, Barack Obama's massive spending experiment hasn't healed our economy. His new experiment risks their future and our health. The Republican National Committee is responsible for the content of this advertising. <laughs> you know, like just everything was like an experiment and it was risky. And, and it was so easy if you weren't doing the building of this package to build fear about this package. And it seemed that everything was, even though the Republicans were doing this like this this kind of well concerted fear machine. It seemed like Obama was gonna get it done. And then Ted Kennedy died. And good morning and welcome to today on this sad Wednesday morning, the US flag flying at half staff in front of the US Capitol building in Washington. That's the site right there in honor of Senator Ted Kennedy, the nation's third longest serving senator. There is no quarterback on the field now. Mm. It's not enough to be a cheerleader like the president's been for the last several months. He's got to get on the field and be the quarterback that Ted Kennedy was all those years and make the audible decision. He's got to make the call. And then it kind of triggered this very strange, so like Martha Coakley was running against Scott Brown in Massachusetts. Oh Scott Brown the won. The race you couldn't lose as a Democrat. It was the, it's Massachusetts. It's uh-huh. uni- they, the state that approved universal health care. Never underestimate one guy with a pickup truck. I'm Scott Brown. I drive a <laughs> <laughs> and that was the that was the election that took them down to 59 mm-hmm. and then it became this like very strange world in which democrats were like well we can use this thing called the reconciliation reconciliation <laughs> the nuclear option so, we can change rules the nuclear option right and and now all these reporters have to explain like what's reconciliation oh it's a it's a procedural maneuver in the senate mm-hmm. where you only need a simple majority rather than a super majority and that kind of I think that gets lost in in the grand scheme, but it does cloud this like seemingly pure uh, like goal that Obama had. He hosted the healthcare summit. Do you remember that thing? Yeah, like healthcare summits. He oh took it out on the God. road. He he did everything he could. He had another bicameral uh, meeting of Congress where Joe Wilson yelled at him, "You, you lie. lie," because uh, he said that his healthcare plan wouldn't cover illegal immigrants. How many times do you need to pitch this thing? Mm-hmm. And, and when he was taking it on the road, when he, he did this big Obamacare show, all these other Democrats were having town hall meetings. Mm-hmm. Town summer hall meetings, of 2009. Yeah. Long, hot summer. And you had reporters going to these meetings because these moments would go viral where people would capture them on their phones of Tea Party protesters screaming about death panels. This is not health reform. This is control. Yeah. Control over our lives. Somehow... They pass this thing in, in you know, a little bit of, like, confusing procedural whatever, uh, using, like, reconciliation and all that stuff. But mm-hmm. that slog was, like, I remember the day that it was signed. It was uh, 2010. 2010. Yeah, it was a BFD. And as, it was, uh, yeah, Joe Biden as Joe Biden said, right, in 2010. And it felt like, it almost felt like 95% of what it should have been because yes. it, all this, like, It didn't have the public option because right. folks like Joe Lieberman opposing right. the public option. You had all these concessions to the insurance companies. Joe Scarborough called it one of the biggest gifts to the insurance companies that anyone could imagine. Uh, it was largely based on a Republican plan from years past. Uh, and in another thing that I think is interesting that President Obama had that uh, President-elect Trump doesn't was approval ratings. Yes. He was coming in with sky-high approval ratings. He yes. had his personal popularity, and everybody was always saying, this is what he's cashing in on. When he goes out and does one of these rallies, he's using that personal capital he has. I think it actually kind of worked against him. Okay. Because when you come in with high approval ratings, yeah. then every story that gets written yeah. about you over the next year is about how your approval ratings are slipping. Mm-hmm. Everything you try to do runs the risk of you losing popularity and therefore a press which is trying to explain this complex overhaul of a major policy issue in America to the public Mm -hmm. has to revert to the easy thing Mm -hmm. which is just saying like does the public like it or do they not like it? Well how do we know (laughs) if they like it? Well let's look at those approval ratings. The president's approval rating on health care is slipping according to a brand new poll out from the Washington Post and ABC News. In the past three months the president's handling of health care is down 8% from 57 to 49%. Wow. Now, Below that ceiling of Donald Trump's at like line. 30. Wow. Like every step he takes is going to be like Donald Trump's approval rating is above 35 for the first time and we have <laughs> rolled out the red carpet and we love him. And the dynamics are different because now Trump has less to lose so mm-hmm. he can take a bigger gamble and if it goes up then it's like wow. <laughs> look, at, look at this guy. <laughs> look at him go. <laughs> look at him. He's winning us back. Let's talk about 
um, more healthcare because we're just talking about one topic. <laughs> That's okay. We can cut it there. Right? <laughs> that sounds great. Okay. Um, should we say back to you? Back, back to, to you. you. <laughs> Guys, another great report. So glad that you're still with us. And now, Ben to Dr. Melissa Thomason. All right, Melissa Thomason, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are actually recording this on Thursday, January the 19th. It is the last day of Barack Obama's term in office. And one of the key points right now that's going into this new government is what's going to happen with health insurance, what's going to happen with the Affordable Care Act. And we've, we're almost seven years into this thing. And in a speech on October 20th, Obama said that, quote, never in American history has the uninsured rate been lower than it is today. Is this true? And if so, how has the quantity of those covered affected the quality of coverage? Okay, well, thanks for having me today. I'm happy to talk about that. So it is the last day of Barack Obama's term, and one of his signature pieces of legislation is the Affordable Care Act. And um, you asked the question, is the uninsured rate the lowest that it has ever been? And I would say it's arguably the lowest that it's been since probably, you know, the 19, the early 1960s. So since sort of we've had modern a modern healthcare system. Certainly right. in the 1920s, before insurance existed, it was it was lower. But but in the terms of our modern system, it is lower now. I think the last thing I read suggested that only um, that 41 million. Or 20 million people have gained coverage since 2010 when the Affordable Care Act was enacted. Excellent. And, and, and when you look at the changes, how has including these folks, has it affected the quality of health care? Or are you seeing, an, you know, is, is it making it better? Is it making it worse? What do you see the changes that have happened? Well, I think in terms of including people, you know, for the majority of people, it hasn't necessarily affected the, their health care. I'm sure that some people worry that there might be a large demand for health care in lines and waits, but I don't I haven't heard anything that that's happened. And in fact, the act has some features that have actually probably improved the quality of health care. Um, for example, it encouraged the development of affordable care organizations and encouraged the development or the adoption of medical record systems. And all of these things can arguably improve quality and value in health care. Hey, Melissa, this is Bob Crawford. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, sure, Bob. My question for you is, at what point did the idea that health care was a right, was a human right, come into the American political consciousness? And that's a, that's a great question. I mean, when we look at it in history, really, you know, by 1940, in the early 1940s, less than 20% of Americans had health insurance coverage. And healthcare costs were rising, but they still weren't impossibly high. And medical technology was fairly low. You have to remember that penicillin wasn't even available until after World War II. Um, so it was still not a huge issue. But I would say in the 1940s and 1950s, as the employment-based system that we have today grew, people recognized that people who didn't have jobs, so the unemployed, the very poor, the elderly, and perhaps people too sick to work, were shut out of coverage, and there have been a number of attempts over time to close those gaps. One of the things that sets us apart from other countries in the U.S. is the way that we set up our health insurance plan. Uh, most notably that in the United States, health care is provided by the employer and not by the state or some other nationalized plan. And that, that's really a big difference between us and the European countries and Canada. Can you explain the differences between these two options and why the U.S. went on the employer-provided path? Well, I mean, there are really, there are more than two options because some countries like Canada have nationalized health insurance where, you know, the, still the physicians work for themselves and not for the government in contrast to a system um, in the UK where the, the doctors are actually government employees. So we have a completely different system. And we, we really started with a, nat with a, an employment based system because it was, it was because for years and years, insurance companies, traditional insurance companies, didn't view health as something they could actually insure. I mean, they thought that if you gave person insurance for when they were sick, people would always be sick and they would have difficulty <laughs> monitoring it and only sick people would want insurance. And in the 1920s, hospitals started to become a more important part of life in America and they got more expensive. 
And some hospitals recognized that people had trouble paying bills. And they said, it's not a lot of money. And if they set it aside, they could pay it. But since they don't, they don't have it. And so kind of the first hospital-based prepayment plan that later developed into Blue Cross and Blue Shield developed in the late 20s when Baylor University Hospital said, you know, we'll sell prepaid care to a group of Dallas teachers. They'll pay us $6 a year apiece, and that'll entitle them to 21 days of care in the Baylor University Hospital. And it was pretty successful. More and more hospitals started doing this, and the blue, that those plans initially formed the Blue Cross system. And what really, what the Blue Cross system showed insurance companies was that you could insure health in this way by selling it to groups of people who were healthy enough to work, right? So groups of employees. Right, and that right. really led us down that path. And along the way, we've had um, accommodation through government policy, through the tax system. And we've had fierce opposition from groups like insurance companies and physicians who felt that their professional authority would be undermined or insurance companies would be put out of business if the government had a single-payer national plan. Is that true? Yeah, that's true, right? I mean, you saw this, for example, in the deliberation before the ACA was passed. Some people suggested that the federal employee benefit health plan should maybe be opened up to people without insurance as a way of giving them the option to purchase care. And insurance, that was called the public option. And right. insurance companies fought it tooth and nail. Physicians have always been opposed to things that they feel like as they say, might interfere with the doctor-patient relationship. And their opposition to these kinds of plans goes back to the progressive era, so even before 1920. Uh, could you take us through that? Could you take us through the, uh, the way that those things change? Um, sure. I mean, so in the, 19, in the progressive era, there were a few states that talked about state-level health insurance. And at the time, it was more disability insurance because medical care was pretty ineffective, but it did include some coverage for a visit to a doctor. And... and it took a while for the AMA to establish a position, but by 1917, it was clear that they were opposed to it. And then, you know, the 20s kind of happened. The Blue Cross plans form in the 30s. And you have to remember that Blue Cross only covered people's visits in the hospital. It actually didn't provide any coverage for doctors. And doctors were adamant about that. I mean, they really wow. didn't want third-party interference. And the kind of thing that, that changed was, the Social Security Act of 1935. And initially, uh, the Committee of Economic Security recognized that there might be a need for kind of a health care plan, nationalized health insurance. And it was in the initial bill, but it became obvious that unless that was struck from the bill, that there was no way that the Social Security Act could pass. And so it wasn't, in it ultimately wasn't included. But it was also a signal to physicians that, th that this insurance was here to stay. And if they wanted to have a say in it, they'd better come up with something on their own. And so it was the physicians who actually started Blue Cross's um, companion plan, Blue Shield, that paid for physician visits. But unlike Blue Cross, where a person goes to the hospital and it's free, you know, they've paid their premium, Blue Shield basically paid a fixed amount and physicians could bill the patient whatever else beyond that fixed amount they wanted to. So they, they retained some of their ability to charge price to charge whatever price they wanted under those plans huh, that seems like an interesting uh, split in incentive sets right because the 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 insurance companies would almost certainly not want to only insure people who went to hospitals right because if you could have something that was prevented it would be cheaper to add on preventative care which would be the, the option to see a doctor before it got to a hospital pro level problem right right well initially these are just separate plans the commercial companies aren't in that at all and you have to remember you're dealing with a time when it's not obvious that physicians were, the physician care was hugely effective. I mean, we had right. antibiotics in the 40s. They could diagnose. They could tell you what you're going to die of. They could talk about hygiene. But there wasn't a lot they could actually do for you, right? So right. the modern idea of preventive care is actually kind of a more recent, recent development. So, so could, could you talk about um, other health care battles in Congress, like when LBJ was president? What was his proposal sure. for health care? Well, I mean, there have been so many, but I can, I can talk about it. So after Roosevelt in the 1940s, this came up under um, President Truman's administration. And again, the AMA, particularly the AMA, came out just very opposed. In fact, they even had pamphlets talking about 
how this was socialized medicine. And they, they just kept saying socialized medicine. They talked about Lenin. They talked about socialization in all areas of life. And because it was still early medical care, you know, it still wasn't something that was bankrupting people. And so most people who had care had it through their employers. You know, the, there was definitely a need for the elderly to have care because those were people who wouldn't work, who, who needed care. And there were a lot of plans in the 40s and 50s that talked about that. So, for example, Eisenhower talked about an, a kind of precursor to Medicare in the 1950s, but physician opposition was so strong that none of these plans managed to pass. So in, the, in 1965, when Medicare and Medicaid were enacted, I think what changed was that, one, it, medical care was now becoming more expensive. The va- you know, at least 70% of working aged people had coverage. And it was something that President Kennedy was a fan of, and he was kind of martyred, and there was just more popular support for Medicare. And so the AMA really had to sort of and they were opposed nonetheless, but they just had to get on board. Huh. So a lot of people now, I've seen a lot of articles that are coming out now that the, the Republican Congress is talking about, you know, repealing and replace uh, Obamacare right now. A lot of people have said that there's an irony in the fact that, you know, that the plan that Obama eventually adopted uh, and, and the Congress adopted almost seven years ago, that this was a, originally a Republican plan. I think that it had been proposed by Richard Nixon, and then later it was the basis of what Mitt, uh, Mitt Romney had uh, developed as the as governor. Uh, how true is this? That's actually really true, and and it is and it is ironic. And 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 interestingly, Nixon was a was a big proponent of Eisenhower's activities in the 1950s too, and so he tried in '71 and '72 a program that relied on employer mandates, much like Obamacare, to um, extend, you know, to, to try and extend insurance to people. And so, you know, I've heard it called, if we're called anything but Obamacare, the Republicans would <laughs> like it a whole lot better. And I, I think there's a lot of truth to that. A rose by any other name. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and, 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 and similarly in Massachusetts. I mean, what's really true through history is that politicians have accommodated corporate interests. So we've accommodated insurance companies, we've accommodated pharmaceuticals, um, we, you know, we have very strong lobbyists, and so, and and similarly with physicians, so that that all attempts at reform have been through private insurance. So Nixon tried by just, you know, making employers insure people. Is there any way to do it where you accommodate special interest groups, and yet the American people get the best possible health care for the lowest possible cost? <laughs> hmm. I get you know probably in the same world where unicorns and Santa exist side by side. Well, wait a minute, Santa does exist. I know. Well, I, the thing is, is that I mean the special interest group politics and people, insurance companies, I think knew this as they were setting up insurance that it would make healthcare more expensive, because people who aren't aware of the full cost of what they're buying tend not to worry about how much they buy. And physicians, who at the time were reimbursed for every single procedure they do, tend to do more procedures than, you know, than is actually necessary. On the other hand, the system has encouraged incentives, you know, for technological development, for the development of new drugs. And so it's been good in that way. It's just, it's a very expensive, very wasteful system. Is the, is the grass always greener? I've, I've been in, uh, in cabs and, in and such in Canada and I've and this is even before Obama was in office and I would ask about health care and they would say they always complained about it they'd be like well now they're taking away this or they're charging extra for that or they're you know it's like we look at Can- Canada's health care plan and we're like we need something like that but if you go to Canada and you talk to people they talk about wait lists they talk about again like always getting less every year getting less paying more is is there a, a system that, that works? I mean, or, or are we just kind of chasing a mirage? Is there a system that works? Well, the Canadian system works, but again, because of medical technology, it's going to get expensive every year. And they don't ration by price like we do, but they ration by time spent waiting in line and the availability of procedures. And I've had friends in, in the United Kingdom who say the same thing. It's like, well, you know, if you need your knee done, you'll wait a year to do it. Or, you know, you need a heart procedure, you'll wait to do it. And so 
all systems tend to ration healthcare. It's the, the fact that we choose price over time to ration ours. And it seems like the problem with, with health insurance before the ACA was that for, for individuals with pre-existing conditions who weren't working, finding affordable health care was very difficult. And so the ACA tried to alleviate this by requiring all individuals to have health care and kind of pooling the sick and healthy people who didn't have health care into the health insurance marketplace. And the idea is that when you put healthy and sick people together, you'll be able to charge a premium to all of them that is more affordable. But I think part of the problem is that the penalties for not having health insurance under the ACA have been so low that more people than expected have opted just to pay the penalty than purchase the coverage. And so costs are still rising. So we hear a lot from from uh, President-elect Trump, and when this airs, it'll be President Trump, about buying health care across state lines. How much of a difference could that make in cost? Well, my understanding is that, that won't make a difference in cost because insurance companies you know, so insurance companies can operate across state lines now. They just have to operate according to that state's laws, right? And so if you think about if we, if we let them operate across state lines, it'll be something like when we let the, the credit cards operate across state lines, and they all went to Sioux City, right, South Dakota or whatever, <laughs> right. no. where they find the state with the kind of most lax regulations and, and work it that way. But it's, I don't notice that credit card fees have fallen tremendously or anything <laughs> like that. So I, don't, I think that insurance companies, when they want to offer insurance across state lines, I mean, we all know that Aetna operates in multiple states, for example, and so I don't really see that as a feasible solution for dramatically lowering costs. At, at the heart of it, in economic terms, it's really it's a problem of collective action, right? Which is that every individual, like individuals making decisions that are the, the best for them, make co- collectively make decisions that are are not optimal. I mean, in this sense, I mean the problem is that you know if people who are healthy, they look at it and they go, "It's not worth it to buy health insurance because I'm healthy," and they don't, and then they decide to buy health insurance once they have a problem. Well, then they have to buy into a health insurance program that is larger, much larger percentage of that of the people in that pool are ill. So, I mean, this is the heart of it, right? I mean, how do we how do we figure out a way? Is is single payer really and and and, and mandatory uh, insurance? Is this the only way to really deal with this problem? No, it's not. I mean, I think if mandatory insurance, we're going to have to make it more mandatory. I mean, obviously, healthy people who still find the penalty cheaper are still choosing to pay the penalty. And like you said, the problem is when they get sick, they still need treatment. And sometimes they've let stuff go and it's more expensive. And we don't have a credible commitment. No one in this country wants people to just die on the street. And so we end up paying to treat them later at a higher expense. And so it makes sense to require them to have health insurance the whole time so that they get the care they need before they need it. And then when they're healthy, they kind of subsidize the premiums for you know, they're sick community members. But you could do it another way. I mean, I've heard Republicans talking about high risk pools. So some states, including Ohio, where I am, had high risk pools before the Affordable Care Act. And the idea was that we'd pool all the people in the state and they'd have some subsidy for it and it would make premiums cheaper. But either way, you're going to, either way, this is what happens. You have a high risk pool, so where you subsidize and uh, somebody has to pay either through taxes or something people who need insurance, and then people who don't have insurance are going to be in that pool later. Or you have to provide an individual mandate so people are covered the whole time, but you might have to subsidize some of those healthy people to get them to be covered. But just saying, you know, it's not going to be cheaper to rely on high-risk pools because the money has to come from somewhere. So, so, So you would then say, I mean, this is the question, you know, in economics, you know, a lot of times we assume that the market is the best means, and sometimes, unfortunately, these people assume it's the only means um, uh, to, to provide something. This seems like a case, a classic case, in which markets simply don't work. Uh, is that the case, or is is it possible that maybe there's just another market-based solution that we could turn to? Well, I would, you know, I'm I love as an economist. I don't think you can be an economist and not love markets, and I love markets. <laughs> and when markets work well, they work well. Right. Exactly. But but when there are problems in markets, the, the kinds of problems that we see in healthcare, for example, there's what we call 
information, there's a problem of unequal information. So doctors know a lot more about what you have than you do. There's a lack of, you know, it's hard for people to have competition. There's, there's a number of problems. But the biggest one is the fact that sicker people are going to want or have private information about when they're sick, and they're going to have a greater tendency to buy insurance than somebody who knows that they're a pretty healthy person. And so the insurance company has difficulty setting premiums that don't just rise over time when the sick people then spend money like they're sick. Then the premiums go up, so a couple healthier people decide, okay, maybe I can't afford this, and they drop out. The remaining people in the pool are then sicker, so the premiums go up more. Right. So a few of the marginally healthy drop out again. And and pretty soon, no one can afford that insurance. And that's why you really need healthy people in there to balance everything out. I, I live in North Carolina, and we, like you, well, we did. We had a Republican governor, Pat McCrory, who refused to expand Medicare. But you, Ohio was a, is a unique state where you had a Republican governor, John Kasich, and he did expand Medicare. How did that help right. Ohio? And, and, and explain for our listeners who may not know, what does it mean to expand Medicare under the ACA? Okay. Sure. And, you know, and I think that was, I mean, I personally think that was a great decision by Governor Kasich, who said, who just recognized the fact that a lot of people didn't have access to health care. And when the ACA offered federal money to expand Medicaid in states, he took them up on it. So did 31 other states, plus the District of Columbia, and a number of states um, said, you know, no, we're not going to, we're not going to expand Medicaid. Now, Medicaid came about at the same time as Medicare, but it's different. So Medicare, obviously, everyone enrolled over 65 as Part A, Part B is voluntary, you know, there are all these other parts. And it's really, basically, the intent was originally to cover the elderly. Medicaid is actually funded by states with federal matching grants, and the idea is to cover poor people. Now, states couldn't cover every poor person, so the federal state, the federal government sets minimum guidelines, and then each state can individually be more generous. But some of the states, you know, if you're a single man, like in Indiana, no matter how poor you are, you'll never get covered on the state's Medicaid system, unless you're like below 50% of poverty or something. I actually can't remember. But what the Medicaid expansion said is it encouraged states to extend Medicare coverage to everyone, whether you're a pregnant woman, whether you're a kid, whether you're a man, whether you're married, to anyone with incomes below 138% of the federal poverty level. So some people who you know, were too wealthy to afford Medicaid under the, previous, under the previous lack of an ACA could now qualify and buy into the Medicaid program. Then the ACA, you know, similarly, they recognize that even for people with incomes higher than that, they would have difficulty. And so it included subsidies for people even with incomes four times higher than poverty. Yeah, one of the arguments that a lot of times you hear people say when they're opposed to uh, expansion and things like the ACA, a lot of times what they'll say is, I shouldn't have to pay for someone else's health care. If they, you know, and a person should have the right to choose it or not, but I shouldn't have to pay for it. Um, you know, the thing that, that, that I've noticed, though, is that it's not like people aren't going to the hospital. Hospitals have to treat people, right? And and so, you know, it's not like if, if there's an insurance plan, you know, it's not like you're not paying for it. These hospitals are, are, are writing these uh, writing this, this money off. Somebody is paying for this. The services are being provided. So people had originally argued that if you could get people into health insurance plans, it would ultimately be cheaper for everyone because they would get preventative care. But I've also recently heard that the, the numbers suggest that that's not happening. Could you talk about that? What historically has, have we seen, have we seen this to be the case? Well, it is the case that your people pay for the care of other people, whether they like it or not. I mean, that's, that's, you're absolutely correct. Wait, because- I'm not going to pay for Ben's health care. He smokes cigars and he drinks vodka and I'm just not going to do it. <laughs> Don't drink a lot of beer easy, man. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> we need we need levity. This this conversation is becoming far too serious. <laughs> it's, 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 it's only when Matt Negrin's in town. That's it. That's it. Okay. <laughs> well, I think it is true that you know somebody's paying. So the hospitals are writing that off, but then they're getting collections from the government. They're getting disproportionate share payments to the number of Medicaid. And you're right, hospitals are obligated to treat individuals who show up at their door. So you're paying whether you like it or not. As, and unfortunately, I'm, you sound like you're better read up on it than me. I don't know whether 
the ACA is saving money in terms of preventive care or not? I mean, that's a that's a tough question, and I think it actually kind of goes beyond economics. So I went into economics, so I wouldn't have to answer tough questions, just so you know, I'm doing this just for you. But, Thank you. I mean, it's, it's a question of, you know, you give somebody a vaccine that prevents polio, it's cheaper than preventing polio. On the other hand, if you treat somebody, if you convince a smoker to quit smoking, they're not going to die of lung cancer, but they'll live a lot longer, and you're going to have to treat them forever. So it's not only about, you know, the cost of care, as long as it's about whether people's lives are improved and the quality of their lives and whether they're productive outside of their healthcare situation, right? So it's, it's helping individuals lead better, more productive lives. And if you have healthcare throughout your life, you're going to lead a healthier, more productive life than if you wait till the bitter end when you're just very sick to show up at a doctor. Moving back to the history a little bit, uh, I think we need to talk about Bill Clinton and the Clinton's attempt at healthcare reform right. in 93. Could you, for our listeners, uh, talk about that? Because that was, that was a debacle, or it became a debacle. Was, it, was that a partisan firestorm, or, or was it the way they approached it? I think I'm also starting to think that as long as it had Clinton's name attached, it was probably not going to go anywhere either. <laughs> but, you know, it was, it was a bit of a debacle. And with all due respect to the Clintons, who I think really tackled a very tough subject, it was, again, the idea that they wanted to work within and you know they knew they needed to use existing health insurance companies and so their scheme really relied on setting up big health insurance purchasing cooperatives you know they relied on an employer mandate pay or play but i think that for small employers and things like that the the idea behind it was that there would be set up these government managed health insurance purchasing cooperatives where if kind of like the individual exchange on a much grander scale. So right now, employers are re- required to provide conforming health insurance that's affordable under the ACA. But under Clinton, it was like you had to you had to pay for it or you had to pay into this thing. And there was these big purchasing cooperatives, and it looked like it would change healthcare for a lot more people. And the other thing is, is that I would argue that in the early 1990s, we were starting to be alarmed at the, at the at the share of healthcare, I think healthcare as a share of GDP was 12%, where it's more like 18% now. But wow. employers weren't feeling as crushed by health insurance costs as they are now. I have a feeling that if we offered employers the opportunity to just ditch everybody on an exchange, some of them might be tempted. <laughs> right. That, that's and that's what I'm wondering is that you know from a business owner's perspective, it's got to become more and more appealing to change from the current system because you know you have a large number of people who have expectations about what they're supposed to be provided but you know you know when when your premium goes up i mean i'm i'm a faculty member at a university as well you know and 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 i see that the insurance still goes up you know my university's got to want to see it go somewhere else businesses have to see at some point enough have to say this will be so much cheaper and so much less burdensome from us if we could ditch it do you think that there will be a point at which you see those companies come around and begin lobbying to have a shift away from the employer-based system and onto something that maybe looks more like single payer? I think it's certainly possible. I mean, so economists think that as an employee, I'm paying for my health insurance by receiving a lower wage. So the extent that Miami University pays $10,000 for my health insurance, my income, my salary is 10000 lower than it would be otherwise. So so we think that there's a compensating kind of thing that happens. So theoretically, if Miami were to want to not give me health insurance coverage, they would have to give me $10,000 <laughs> like more <it. laughs> in, in salary. But actually, because um, health insurance is tax preference, so I don't pay income tax on my health insurance plan. If they gave me $10,000, then if, you know, if I'm in the 20% tax bracket, that would only be eight. So they'd really have to give me like a little bit more than that to cover right. the tax. And so it would be, you know, it's not obvious with the current way that health employer contributions to employee health insurance premiums and the employer tax liability on fringe benefits. It's not obvious that it would be a benefit yet, but we've certainly seen employers do this with retirement. I mean, in when I was growing up, everybody had a defined benefit program. You work for 30 years, you get some percentage of your final salary forever until you die, and and that was expected, right? These big pension plans. And we've seen 
employers just abandon these to the current kind of 401k. Geez, here's your, we're not going to pay for you after you <laughs> retire, but here's your $10,000 a year. Try and do it yourself. Right, right. Yeah, it's that's not kinda... obvious to me that healthcare couldn't go the same way. Yeah, and that, that looks real nice right now, but in uh, 50 years, it might be, look real sad. Right. When, or, you know, and I've heard Paul Ryan talk about premium, what he calls premium supports for Medicare, Medicare vouchers. And that uh-huh. would worry me, too, is that, you know, depending on how those were structured, if, and I think he was talking about getting higher vouchers to sicker people. How do you measure that? But $10,000 in a health care voucher buys a lot for somebody who's never had anything wrong with them, and it goes nowhere for somebody with a serious pre-existing condition. So what right. sounds like a lot of money isn't. And with health insurance, or excuse me, with health care costs rising over time, and again, most of that is due to technological advances, um, it's not going to go very far for a long time. In a few years, it'll be very expensive. I, I think one of the less flattering things that President Obama will be remembered for is the sentence, if you like your plan, you can keep it. Can mm-hmm. you can you explain what went wrong? Did did he did he know that beforehand that a lot of people were going to be bumped off their plans, or or was did that even take him by surprise? So I like to I like to think that what he meant by that is that if you buy insurance, you know that I you know if you buy insurance on the exchange, if you like your plan, you'll keep it. Unfortunately, it seems that some of those insurance companies um, have had trouble have been losing money because of some congressional changes in reinsurance and risk corridors and things like that. And so they haven't, people haven't been able to keep their plan or they've been able to keep their plan only with significant increases. And I imagine that some people haven't been able to keep their plan, but I think that's less of it. I'm not aware of, of legions of people losing health insurance under the ACA. Yeah. I work for a very small company and uh, uh-huh. a lot of the, I mean, <laughs> about th- we have about 20 some people in our organization and and several people are on the ACA and and I had both people who got bumped off their plans and and people who were shocked by the amount of money that they had to pay for their insurance that were supporters of right. the ACA but when the the bit when they signed up and when the bill came came due it was just shocking for them it was hard to make the make the payment for it right. um, as we sit on the precipice of the repeal of Obamacare which will pro- probably could possibly happen the same day we air this show, which would be Monday. Um, do you predict, and I know Ben's told me historians are terrible at predicting the future. I don't know about economists. I don't know their <laughs> record, but do you predict that um, the you'll be accepted regardless of pre-existing conditions? You can stay on your plan, your parents' plan until you're 26, and... Uh, no lifetime maximums. Do you, do you think that that will be included in the Trump care plan? Well, I mean, President Trump tells us that he's, or President elect Trump tells us that he's going to roll out something the day that he appeal, repeals Obamacare, which kind of, I think, left some Republicans surprised. But... <laughs> he, doesn't know how, he doesn't know how to manage expectations, does he? <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I know he also said, yeah, well, he's also said insurance for everybody. I think that right now there's a lot of, I think what, what I'm hearing is that a lot of people who really, with pre-existing conditions, are ter- and pre-existing conditions can be acne, pregnancy, diabetes. Right? A significant number of people qualify as having pre-existing conditions, and these people are terrified they'll lose coverage. So I imagine that, that whatever the repeal, whenever it happens and however, whatever form it takes, there will probably be something about the fact that, that you can't deny coverage to people with pre-existing conditions. But I wonder if they'll say that you have to charge, an, you know, the high-risk pools didn't deny coverage to people with pre-existing conditions uh-huh. either. But if you don't subsidize it, the care becomes, the premiums are unaffordable anyway. So you can say, well, we're not denying people, but if you're not making the premium affordable, you're in effect denying them. Uh, and so, the, you know, the Republicans have talked about lowering subsidies and, and things like that. And so I'm not sure how they're going to manage it. What I know is that unless healthy people and sick people are in a pool together, healthy people are going to pay a lot cheaper premium than less healthy people. And so the question is how you make that premium affordable for the people who need it most. 
Wow. And so what, what is, what advice do you have for us policymakers moving forward? Like what, what have we seen? What can we learn from the history? Cause you know this so well, what, what, what would you suge- suggest if you were sitting down with Paul Ryan or Donald Trump right now, what advice would you give them to, to make insurance better? Well, I mean, I understand that they have a nearly impossible job with lobbyists and insurance companies and everything else, but I would actually encourage that. I mean, in some ways, I think that what would make sense would be a plan, a health care plan similar to what we've done with education. That is clearly a lot of people like their employer-sponsored care. So those are the people who aren't that unhappy. The employers are increasingly unhappy, but we can kick that can down the road because <laughs> right. we know we like to do that as politicians. But it seems like where the, where the rubber hits the road here are for the poor people, for elderly people, and for people in those you know, who are temporarily unemployed or have a serious illness. And it seems like, you know, Bernie, Bernie Sanders' Medicare for at least those people, to put those people all into a bigger group and subsidize it might make more sense. And if you have the means to do so and you want to opt out, then you can opt out. But you have to have, you know, if, you're, if you have another form of health insurance. It's sort of like how we offer public education to everybody, and if you don't like it, you can pay to send your kid to a private school. Of course, that's all changing now too. So maybe that yeah. you know. That that you know what I love it because that's exactly the way that I was thinking about it. Like like about two days ago, I was like, well, if we had it, people because people complain, they're like, if we have you know a public uh, healthcare system, then I'll get terrible coverage. And it's like, well, no, actually, you won't. You don't have to take that. I mean, certainly, private companies could 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 sprout up for for people who have more money. Right. Now, the the thing is, is that you have to recognize that Medicare isn't actually very good coverage. It has lifetime limits. It has high deductibles. You know. And it doesn't, and providers are going to hate that idea because it doesn't reimburse providers very well either. So, I mean, you'd have to, you'd have to tweak it here and there. But right now, what I hear about lifetime maximums is that if you have a child with special needs, you know, you can hit that cap fairly quickly. Like I said, when 20 years ago, a million dollar cap sounded, nah, you know, I'll never hit that. And today <laughs> you can hit that in, in a couple months. Yeah, I have a seven-year-old daughter with a pre-existing uh, condition of cancer, and uh, she's a special needs child. So I follow these debates very closely. And, and thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate you taking your time to, uh, to, to speak with us. Well, well, my pleasure. If I can answer any more questions, please, you know, if I think of some miraculous cure, I'll let you guys know. <laughs> that would <laughs> be you. amazing. Let us break the story. Yeah, so we're, so, sure. so we're going to have <laughs> yeah, so we're going to have Ben fix Russian U.S. policy uh, miraculously, and and you will fix a uh, healthcare policy, and and the road to now, we we are truly bringing a better day for for all our listeners. <laughs> we'll invite you to the Nobel Prize ceremony. That's right. Terrific. <laughs> Listen, thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for joining us on the road to now. Today's episode was produced by Bob Crawford, Ben Sawyer, and Ian Scott. Uh, it was edited by Nick Corrigan, and the music was by the wonderful Paul DeFiglia. For more information about the podcast, go to www.theroadtonow.com and follow us on social media, Twitter, at road underscore two underscore now, and our Facebook page as well. For Bob Crawford, I'm Dr. Ben Sawyer. Have a great day.